Martin, on this report, they're also talking about like brute forcing VPNs. So it looks like firewalls under attack, but also VPNs, right, where they're just trying to guess the passwords, I, I take it? Yeah, any any system. Um, I mean, if there's a constant background noise of people trying username and password um, combinations, um, it's why you should really change the default password on any system. Like as soon as you're opening out the packet or you're taking delivery of it, change the default password immediately. We can't reduce risk to a minimum, but but these are good places to start. Um, and the other thing is uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, so especially with administer accounts, whether that's a minister um, account on any network system or your network infrastructure, absolutely make sure that you've got to have uh, multi-factor authentication on that. Any user account on your network infrastructure, make sure you've got multi-factor authentication. Hey everyone, it's David Bombal back with Martin Lee from Telos. Martin, lots of things happening. Hopefully you're going to tell us about it. Welcome back. Well, it's great to be here. Um, maybe it's unfortunate we have so many things to talk about, but yeah, stuff that needs to be discussed and needs to be spread so that people know what to do. Martin, I've got to address the elephant in the room, right? Yeah. Tell us if re released a report, but like last week at the time of this recording, there was this uh, report released about um, firewalls. So Cisco Secure Firewall was hacked, but it's not just Cisco. So we've got like Fortinet, we've got um, Cisco, we've got Palo Alto, there's a whole bunch of them. Fortinet has had a lot of problems recently. And I mean, I can mention various brands, but um, what's, what's going on, Martin? Um, if we go back, this is part of a broader campaign of activity. If you'd have been asking me the same questions this time last year, I'd have been talking about Jaguar Tooth, yep. which is another campaign that we saw. And all the way back, so the we've been talking about this since 2016. So in 2016, there was a CISA report about threats to network infrastructure. Over the years, that threat or that menace of the threat actors has, has got larger and larger. So any, any network appliance, you know, they're small computers. Um, you know, you plug them in and you don't think anything more about them. But, but these things, they have an operating system, they have a CPU, they have spare CPU cycles. And because they've got software on them, really anything that has software on it has a vulnerability. Uh, we in Cisco, we spend a lot of our time making sure that there's a, uh, as few vulnerabilities as possible by hiring very, very good software engineers, by having solid software engineering processes, by having testing, by having good design and design reviews and all that. Still, and with, with anything, there will be vulnerabilities exactly. that creep in. Yeah. What we've been seeing over the past couple of years is really the threat actors taking notice of this. What I say with any threat is you've got to turn it around and think about things from the threat actor's point of view. So if you want to get inside an organization and you're a threat actor, okay, number one, you'd, you'd start with a person, you'd start with phishing, then you'd get malware on a laptop somewhere and, and, then, and then use that to, to spread out your attack throughout, throughout the system. Endpoint protection is actually not bad now. It's pretty good. We are pretty good at detecting bad guys on endpoints, on laptops. We're not perfect, but we're, we're pretty good. I think what that has led to is then the bad guys looking at, well, what else can we get on? Yep. And those network devices, so whether it's firewalls, whether it's routers, whereas it's switches, the bad guys are looking and thinking, hey, if I can get on there, this is a system that has an operating system. It can run software. It's got spare CPU cycles that can be stolen. There will definitely be vulnerabilities there that are waiting to be discovered, but do you have AV running on your router? Yeah, exactly. No, yep. nobody does. Yep. It's just that box in the corner. The black box. Yeah, absolutely. When we're thinking about cybersecurity, we're thinking about our servers. We're thinking about the laptops. We're, we're, we're thinking about people logging in. We're thinking about emails. I think too often we're overlooking that little box with the blinking lights that sits in the, in the cupboard. The bad guys haven't forgotten about it. And so they are now, and we've seen this over the past few years, looking at ways of can they 
exploit the vulnerabilities. We'll first discover the vulnerabilities on the systems, then exploit them, compromise that system as with any uh, attack, get a foothold on it, something which is persistent there, and then use that as a way of furthering the objectives, hitting, uh, use it as a launching point for our further attacks or doing network reconnaissance, but ways of having that point of presence inside a network and then using that for subsequent attacks. This is what we're seeing at the moment. For your audience, this is so, so, so important. You really, really need to pay attention on this. Um, network infrastructure is vulnerable. It's actively being exploited by, by the bad guys. We need to think about this as any kind of computer system. Patch it. You know, whenever we find a problem within Cisco, we're going to be really public about it. We're going to be really, really transparent. If there's a problem, we'll tell you about it. You need to patch it. You need to follow the 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 advice, patch it, make sure it's secure. That in itself probably isn't enough. We need to look at the configuration of the system so you can configure it to be in an insecure state. So think about how these systems are configured. Again, there's advice, there's standards that you can that you can follow, but think about the configuration. As with any computer system, don't expose too much to the outside internet. You know, make make sure that we're we're exposing the Showdown. absolute minimum of services. So again, we're making it difficult for the bad guy to to get in. But again, you know, we 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 can't reduce risk to a minimum. But but these are good places to start. Um, and the other thing is uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, so especially with administer accounts, whether that's a minister um, account on any network system or your network infrastructure, absolutely make sure that you've got to have uh, multi-factor authentication on that. Any user account on your network infrastructure, make sure you've got multi-factor authentication. And then the last bit is, frankly, you've got to be paranoid. You, 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 you've got to look for evidence of, um, of incursion. The evidence is there if you look for it. Um, in the blog, we've described in great detail all the IOCs, how the um, attack looks like, what can you look for. There are other reports as well. Start thinking and start being paranoid. What would it look like if part of my network infrastructure was compromised? How would I discover that? The traces are always going to be there, but you've got to look for it. Um, and actually, the number one trace, so the bad guys, again, they know that the traces are there. Yep. The first thing your bad guy's going to do, going to switch off logging. So again, for the good guys, for the defenders, look for the absence of logs. Look for evidence that someone has switched off a log. This is a telltale signal that that, that something wrong is, is going to be there. Again, think about it from the bad guy's point of view. What are they doing? What are they going to do? And then look for that evidence. Um, the traces will always be there, either in your logs or the fact that you don't have any logs because someone switched it off. Look for that. Those are the clues you need to look for that will then show that actually you've got bad guys in your network infrastructure. When we were preparing for this interview, you mentioned something about a single UDP packet. Can you explain what that was about? So was that related to this? Was that something else? So that's um, that was another attack. The, the um, Danish cybersecurity um, uh, agency produced a, uh, an absolutely superb report um, would have been sort of late last year on um, attack against uh, critical national infrastructure in Denmark. Um, there were 20 something um, suppliers of electricity or in the electricity supply chain that were compromised by a sophisticated threat actor coming in through the network infrastructure. One of the, um, the, the that phone home bit. So again, yeah. Come on, bad guys' point of view. What yeah. are they doing? They want to know that their attack has succeeded. Yeah. One of their phone home, you know, connections um, from one of their devices. It was a single UDP packet. It's crazy. But again, you know, if you can think again, think about it from the bad guy point of view. What do they need? They just need one packet to go back to tell them that they've been successful. From a defender's point of view, we can use this to our advantage. So in your logs, I mean, it's not an easy thing to find out. But, you know, what are the IP addresses that we've only ever pinged once with a single packet? That that yeah. kind of stuff is suspicious. And again, there's only so many ways that you can conduct an attack. There's only so many ways you can establish command and control. There's only so many ways that you can phone home. We can actually look for evidence of this happening in the systems and we can find it. But it's only going to happen 
If you're really paranoid about it and you're actively looking, if you never look, you will never find them. But if you start looking, you can find these bad guys and then take the steps to kick them out of your network. So you make sure that there are logs, number one, because like so, if they yeah. turn off logging, that's a problem. But the, I'm going to push you now because the problem with logs, right, there's so much, it's overwhelming. This is why we have big data systems. This is what it, what, it, what it's all about. Um, yeah. You know, it, think back to the cuckoo's egg in the um, tail end of the 1980s. Um, you know, this was one researcher, guy in a, guy in, a, um, in a university laboratory. He was the systems admin, um, and he hunted down a KGB spy. Um, he did that through looking at the printouts of logs. You know, this was this was the stone age of computing. Now we we have so 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 much more data. Um, it is I. I I hesitate to say it, but I think I believe it's probably easier to find the bad guys because we have the data. The difficulty is actually managing and processing that data. Yep. This is why we have the big data systems. This is why we have the XDR systems to help you do that. But your systems and the data that, you've, that you're logging and, and everything that you've got and the management of that, it's only as good as the questions that you're asking it. If you can ask the right questions and you've got the data that will actually give you those answers... You can find it. This is this is threat intelligence. This is what I write about in my book. This is what it's, say, this so is what it's all about. How do I learn? Is it like uh, a start here, right? Yeah, you 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 start you start there. Number one by by knowing your trade. If you're a network admin or a systems admin, you know 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 how your system works. Know what normal looks like, which is the first the first first bit really is knowing what normal looks like. Make sure that you got the basics right. Um, you know, there's no point doing fancy stuff if you've got you know, you're not patched or you've got stuff wide open, wide open to the network. Get get the basics right. Once you've got that, it becomes a bit of a sport, really. It's a competitive sport. Um, it's about hunting the bad guys. You need your hunting grounds. Your logs and your data are your hunting grounds. And then your skill is in being able to ask the right questions. Think, um, you know, go read these, these, these blogs and think, what would that attack look like in my system? What kind of traces might it leave? And then how would I uncover that and then start asking those questions of your data? See what you can come up. It might not be easy. You might be well coming up with questions that um, that actually you don't have the data to support. You know, you, you wouldn't be able to find the question. That's actually a good thing because you can then start thinking, well, okay, what, I think this is a really good question. What data do I need to keep in order to be able to ask that. And that's the bit you can start going, well, I'll go and ask the boss for some money because I think this is important and I've got a blog here tell us about a, a, an attack and I think we could detect this attack if only we had this data. Also, you might find that you can't quite answer the question that you'd really like but you can kind of find something similar with with what you've got. I'm, I'm uh, very much in favour of working with what you've got when you can. Um, so even if that question that you don't can't quite answer, but you can get something similar, work with that and and start having multiple queries going. And um, when you find something that you think might be um, a, a good question to ask, you know, turn this into a procedure, which is just working in the background continuously and can tell you when some when it identifies something. Um, but if you can have all of these little eyes looking for evidence of compromise, looking for something that's wrong, that's when you're going to find the bad guys. Martin, you're, you're a bit older than perhaps some of the audience, so you're going to, you've got to explain that for everyone who's watching. Okay, so um, it's a super book, um, The Cuckoo's Egg, written by Clifford Stoll. He was a systems admin in, um, was it Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory? Um, anyway, university laboratory that had public sector research contracts, and there was an accounting issue. There was like a couple of cents worth of computing time that hadn't been accounted for. Oh, wow. uh, and, and the boss asked him, can you work out what was wrong here? But it's that bit, there's just some a little tiny thing that, Something, didn't, something's quite, right. that yeah. didn't quite square. Um, and so he goes in and looks into this, uh, uh, what was initially accounting issue, um, looks at it in great detail, is scrolling through the logs, and he identifies yeah, a KGB spy based in, in Germany that was trying to, to, to steal nuclear secrets, as I, as I remember it. But, but what's really pertinent is that it was his sense of questioning. You know, why, why, 
why is our accounting like two cents out? You know, most people just shrug their shoulders, you know, put the thing, you know, hand in the pocket. Well, here you go, it's 10 cents, you know, problem solved. Um, but he was like, no, 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 let, let, let's find out. What do we find? Oh, there's this weird thing. Well, what does that mean? Well, that leads to this, which is which is weird. What what, what What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And and for any threat hunter now, it, it it's that. It's asking those difficult questions, not being satisfied until you've really found the origin of the of of the problem. If anyone in your audience is hiring cybersecurity practitioners and threat hunters, this is why it's so difficult because you'd hire the world's most difficult people. This is the best kind of threat hunter is someone who'll never take no for an answer, who's always asking why? Why is it like that? Why is it like that? But these are the skills that we need. And we need more people who aren't satisfied or just like, oh, we'll just write off this two cents um, uh, an anomaly. It's like, no, 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 no. We've got to find out why. We've got to find out what's happening. We've got to think, what would the bad guys look like on my network? Um, what would happen? How would I find that single UDP packet sent to an IP address that we've never ever contacted before. What would that look like in the logs? How could I write a query to actually see um, if we've ever done this? This this is what we need to do. And it's that sense of wanting to know more of curiosity and insatiable curiosity. This is how we're going to defeat the bad guys. We need this. Martin, you gave us some great tips about like protecting the firewall, right? And one of them is MFA. I've heard like every cyber person I ever talked to, MFA, MFA, MFA. But in the TELUS report now for January to March of this year, one of the biggest threats is MFA. I think 50% 50 or, or something of the attacks that TELUS looked at had MFA issues. MFA is great, but it doesn't seem to be working. MFA fatigue. So um, MFA, it, it's not a silver bullet. It's really, really useful. It, it, it's part of what we need as our basic cybersecurity posture. Um, but it's also important to know the weaknesses of, um, of MFA. Um, I think it's also useful. Let, let's just wind way, way back again to the, the, the Stone Age of computing um, and start thinking about usernames and passwords. So um, we've got mainframe systems um, in universities and we need a way of actually doing the accounting for computer time, who is allowed what. And the way that we came up about that is with usernames and passwords that you need your assigned username, you create your own password, that way you log into your account on this shared computing system and that way your activity can be logged in the logs and we can work out how much to charge you or your department. So it wasn't really a security idea? It was never a security idea. It also, let's be fair, since the dawn of computing, usernames and passwords have never really worked well. My password is still password123. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so right in the early days, we've got the, these, these risks and vulnerabilities that we know about, you know, shoulder surfing, yep. just peering over someone's shoulder. Um, one of the first uh, vulnerabilities in computers that was discovered was the fact that you could actually send the entire uh, file of usernames and passwords to the printer and take it out and then you can use somebody else's username and password to do your pet project um, and use their credits on the system because it's too expensive for you. So th there's always been a motivation to compromise the username and password system. It's never really been secure. No. Um, things have got much better, um, certainly when we move to things such as single sign-on, that instead of having dozens of usernames and passwords in a corporate system, we've got a single username and password, which then gets you onto the network and gets you onto the systems, makes it an awful lot easier for the um, network administrator to administer so that if someone is compromised, we can just kick them off the network and close all of their accounts whilst we resolve the problem. Same when people leave the organization. Again, okay, great, on your last day, one button to click, okay, now you don't have access, so you can't come back in four months and, and, and hack into seeing things. So this is all good. Never been perfect. Multi-factor authentication adds another layer of security on that. So when you're logging in, you're typing in your username, you're typing in your password, you're then getting a ping on your phone, which you're then responding to in some way. That can be just a tap to authorize, or it can be a number that you've got that you've got to type in. There are still weaknesses with this system. Uh, the first 
as with anything that has software in it, there may well be software vulnerabilities. So there might be a software vulnerability in the system. It's the first thing to consider. Secondly, the configuration. We need to get the configuration right. You can configure these things in an insecure state or configure it where there's bypasses. Again, I'm sure almost everyone on your uh, in your audience will have come across the, the 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 issue. The boss wants an exemption. Exactly. You know these things happen, and then you've got to code in an exemption. And in fact, in coding in the exemption, you accidentally may anyone in this group. You know, there's a million and one ways of doing it. But however, this 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 is real life. So we need to think about these things and be aware of it. The other issue is, of course, humans. Whenever we have humans in the mix, again, there's a whole world of vulnerabilities in this. And again, I say, think about things from the bad guy's point of view. Think about things from your user's point of view. The great thing about multi-factor authentication, if the bad guy gets your user's username and password, perhaps through phishing, they can't use that to get access until the user approves it. So what's your bad guy going to do? Okay, bad guy, I'm wearing a black shirt. We're going to try and log into the system. What happens? We get a ping onto our user's phone. Okay, the user thinks, well, I didn't log in. And I'm just going to ignore that. The bad guy does it again and again and again and again. And your user is there trying to get on with their day, with their work, and their phone is going ping, 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 ping. So the temptation on the user is like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to click OK. And then the problem goes away and they can get on with their, with their lives, with their, with their day, without being um, distracted or annoyed by their phone. But in fact, what they've done is they've just authorized the bad guys to get, to get access. So this is a weakness with the system. We need to work with our users. Your users are part of your security system. They can be really, really helpful as sensors. Make sure that your users know what to do if their MFA system is is getting lots of pings on it. This this isn't something to ignore. It isn't something just say okay to make the problem go away. They need to get in touch with you because there is a problem. So incentivize and encourage your users to act appropriately if they identify some kind of problem with a with a with a system. They may not know that it's a security problem, but we need to tell them if the MFA system is just going ping, 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 you need to do something and you need to get in touch with us. And we're not going to shout at you. You know, you're not going to get into trouble. You're not going to get shouted. Indeed, if you're doing it right, you give them an award or give them, at the very least, give them a thank you email for doing it. That gives you the visibility that there's a bad guy coming in. What you do, you know, reset the username and password of your of your user and then the bad guy doesn't have their, their active password at the moment. You might also be able to detect that in the logs if you're, again, if you're looking for it. So this is a good thing to have that automated detection going. We've got a user that's getting like multiple pings um, from the MFA system in a, in a short period of time. Look at what IP addresses are, 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 are trying to connect. You know, that'll give you a heads up. It'll give you a clue. Yeah, MFA improves username and password security. It's not a magic bullet. It's not going to make the problem go away but it gives you an additional point to make the bad guy's life difficult. You know, you're putting up barriers, right? You're, you're putting up barriers. You're making their life difficult. You're also making their job noisy, and you're giving yourself multiple chances to be able to identify that there's an issue, that there's a bad guy trying to attack your system. You've then got multiple opportunities to act. You know, we can disable the IP address. We can lock down a system. We can reset the user's password. We we can actually see if there's part of a further um, action. There might have been a phishing campaign, and this is your first indication there's a phishing campaign. Great. There might have been other people that had fallen for it. You you can you can find this. It's giving you options. The worst thing you can do is not have visibility of the problem and just think, yeah, everything's fine. So modern. It's a problem, right? Because this is highlighted as the big issue in the TELUS report. Yeah. Number one is fatigue. It yeah. seems to be like that where the user just gives up and, and presses the button. Yeah. But, but I want to ask you, because I know the audience will be interested in this, SMS 2FA. Is it good? Should we be using it? Should we replace it? Um, again, it's better than nothing. Absolutely. It goes a long way. It's better than nothing. We're making the bad guy's life difficult, which is um, all about what we do. Typically, the apps are better than doing it by SMS. The reason being is that um, the bad guys can clone your SIM. 
So redirect your SMS into their device. Or if they can log in to your user portal with your phone provider, they may well redirect or request a new um, phone number um, for you. So again, your SMSs may go may go elsewhere. So um, having it on an app in your phone, I would say, is more secure than an SMS. However, that's not to say that the SMS system is inherently secure. It's a hell of a lot better than not having it. But yeah, I do I do slightly worry like when my bank sends me SMS messages. It's like, do you know what? I, I'd really rather have this on an app. Um, again, we've got to think about usability and working with uh, with the uh, with the users and what works for what works well for you being a tech professional may well not work for your 90 year old grandmother you know so so that the security is all about trade-offs um but anything that we can do to make the li- bad guy's life difficult frustrating noisier is all good yeah well in the report and on and some of the Telus people i i watched videos about have mentioned the use of uh voice cloning so they 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 simply dial into your voicemail get your voicemail get your voice off the voicemail, clone it, and then use that voice to phone the help desk to get them to change the SMS or something. So it's crazy, man. Ah, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, technological advance is going to keep us in business, unfortunately. You know, nothing would make me happier than making myself redundant and unemployed. However, um, yeah, you know, human ingenuity uh, never ceases to amaze me. Uh, one of the issues that I'm waiting to happen is actually voice cloning and the use of business email compromise. So this is a scam. We write about it in our in our latest uh, uh, report. Um, been happening for years. Uh, the way that happens is you get an email from your from your boss saying, "I'm at a conference. We've forgotten to pay the invoice. They won't let me give the keynote speech in in 20 minutes unless we pay this invoice. Please, urgently, urgently transfer." Ten thousand pounds, ten thousand dollars, ten thousand euros, whatever, to uh, this bank account, and 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 we'll be good. In fact, complete scam. What happens is the bad guys wait for your big boss to be talking at a conference. He'll be a headline speaker, or they'll be a headline speaker. So they'll know when this individual is going to be on stage. They will time their attack. They will have researched. Um, who who may fall for this? So it's likely to be, uh, it could be an administrative assistant, could be another member of the senior management team, could be the chief financial officer themselves. But it's someone who's going to feel under pressure and also someone who can arrange for the, someone with authority to make, to make the payment. Yep. The way to defeat it is through having good processes of saying, actually, okay, this is great. If we've forgotten to pay the invoice, tell me who the organizer is or I will phone the organizer to confirm that. So we need to have offline confirmation of it. Out of band, Uh, right? Yeah, out of band confirmation or even, you know, send a credit note. Say, yeah, absolutely, we will pay this as soon as possible. However, we can't pay things without three days notice or something like that. So have rock solid procedures. At the moment... We see this with email. Through the wonders of AI, we now have the possibility of voice cloning. So we may well get a phone call, apparently from the boss, using their voice, um, telling you, it's so important, I demand that you you do this. Um, Actually, the the other day, um, my lovely daughter uh, phoned me and she needed me me, me to to pay for something. And I'm like... Are you okay. sure? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Is it your um, daughter? Yeah. Yeah. I, I asked her a couple of questions just to just to verify that she really was my daughter and the type of questions only she would know or only someone, you know, within my family would know. Um, just because, again, you know, be paranoid about this stuff. Um, it, it, it's it's happening. You know, if it's not happening already, it's going to happen in the new future. So, so uh, be aware of it. Within your own friends and family, you know, you can set up a secret password that only you know or a shared memory or a shared joke or a, a, a song line that only that person would know to, veri- to, to, to verify in a business um, environment. You need to have those rock solid financial procedures and have the discipline to make sure that 
everyone follows these, no exceptions. Of course, you know, sometimes, yes, people will forget to make a payment or a payment will fail or, a, or a, an invoice will be, will be missed. Build that into your procedure so that if, that's, if that happens, okay, that's fine. We'll issue you a credit note. We'll email you to say, you know, we're going to follow our procedures. We will pay this. But have those procedures to check and to verify that um, this is a correct payment and don't give in to the time pressure. All of this works by creating a sense of urgency. And if you have those procedures, and someone phones up saying, I need you to pay this now. It needs to be done within 20 minutes. You say, well, actually, our procedures that you signed off clearly state that, um, you know, there has to be a three-day delay. Um, you have to get buy-in from everyone and you have to be rigid and very, very disciplined on that. But if we can do that, we, we, we can solve this scam fairly easily. It's amazing because when I phone some of the UK banks, and I won't mention which, um, they say, don't you want to use voice uh, to authorize your bank account? It's like, I will never do that. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, never, never, ever, ever, ever. Yeah, because in the report, it talks, like you just mentioned, the business email compromise, um, it's like a quarter, sorry, more than double of the previous quarters, more than half of the attacks. So they, it's, it's basically what you've just mentioned, right? Emails, uh, voice cloning, stuff like that to try and get people to send money or do something that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, yeah. And the same with phishing as well. You know, you get a phone a phone call from your IT help desk. Um, oh, we need to verify your account. Can you read me the numbers on yeah, your, um, on your account, authenticator? Yeah. 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 Um, happens actually, I was reading about this the other day with bank fraud. Um, again, the, the supposedly the bank's help desk's phones you and says, we need to verify your account. Can you read me the numbers on your authenticator? No, 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 no. Never, ever, 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 ever. And actually, it annoys me greatly when my bank phones me and wants to talk to me. I say, you know, tell me the the phone number yeah, that I can yeah. verify exactly. remotely. Plus, I'm going to use another phone to phone you back on, um, and then we can talk. But but no way am I ever going to talk to someone who phones me pretending to be my bank um, in in any circumstances. Hey, Martin, on this report, they're also talking about like brute forcing VPNs. So it looks like firewalls under attack, but also VPNs, right, where they're just trying to guess the passwords, I, I take it? Yeah, any any system. Um, I mean, there's a constant background noise of people trying username and password um, combinations. Um, it's why you should really change the default password on any system. Like as soon as you're opening out the packet or you're taking delivery of it, change the default password immediately. Um, so that's something that the bad guys are looking for. Also, the bad guys know we're not particularly good at remembering passwords as a, as as human beings um with the number of password breaches that there have been now yeah. um yeah your passwords a, out there your yeah. your your password is probably out there and at this moment in time there's probably someone trying your username with that password that's been leaked from another from another system um this is another reason why um two factor authentication or mfa is 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 so important um, so that if someone does guess your username and password, and that's whatever system, it's not necessarily a VPN, it could be network infrastructure, it could be a web service, it can be your, your, your webmail account, your bank account, whatever it is, someone is probably trying to either guess your password or use a password that you've used before in order to access that system. So make it difficult for them. If you know your password has been compromised, yeah, it's time to choose a new one. Um, use two-factor authentication and know when you start getting lots of pings on your system that that's not a good sign. But if you can do that, again, you're in a good position. So for the VPNs, 2FA? 2FA, absolutely, 100% 2FA. And then logging, because I I mean, you, you always recommend logging um, and it's in the report as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it'll. Um, th that's your hunting ground. This is where, how you hunt the bad guys. They're they're out there in the logs. Uh, you know, your logs are like your your, your forest where you're hunting uh, hunting wild animals. Um, it's there, but if you don't have the hunting ground, you will never find them. Question about two FA because now we keep yeah. saying two FA, MFA. You know, how it, surely it's difficult for attackers to to do this, or is it easy these days? It's um, it's difficult to do it yourself. Um, however, it's uh, relatively easy to buy a kit. So um, this really goes with any kind of um, threat or attack. The bad guys developed a business about it. You know, coming up with your own uh, bespoke zero days or ways of attacking systems is actually quite difficult. And there's probably relatively few people in the world that are that are capable of doing that. 
um, you know, probably measuring this in the world of tens of thousands, shall we say, um, possibly a hundred thousand, but, but, you know, tens of tens of thousands, certainly not millions. Um, but these people, uh, from their own point of view, again, think about it from the bad guy's point of view. If you come up with a new way of hacking systems, you know, you're not going to work 24 hours a day doing that. You know, you've only got so many hours in a day that you want to work. What you can do is set that up as a business, as a franchise. So license out your um, intellectual property, your attack code and your way of doing it. Create that as a software as a service license it out to affiliates who can then either do it themselves or license it out further. So that way, as the the, the chief bad guy who's come up with the vulnerability uh, or the exploit for the vulnerability in the first case, you could have thousands of people conducting these attacks and take a small cut of that or, or having them paying you rent for your system. And you can make more money than you ever could by doing it yourself. So um, it's a whole business, right? Yeah, yeah. The, these 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 systems exist, and and this is how a lot of cyber crime is um, is conducted. Again, from the defender's point of view, we we can use this to our advantage. If so many attackers are using the same attack, then actually we're reducing the number of attacks that we that we need to defend against. If they're always using the same techniques or the same vulnerability, then we can we can patch the vulnerability or we can put in mitigations from that. We can put in detection code for this attack. So actually, it for, as a defender, it does tend to make our lives easier. I think for society, it's a, it's a bad thing because we're, we're, we're allowing people to start on that apprenticeship of, of, of evil and becoming top, um, top hackers. So we're giving them a way, uh, an easy step into the world of cyber criminality, which is, not, which is not a good thing. But if they're remaining fairly unsophisticated in terms of their attacks, then that gives us opportunities and advantages to defend against it. It's interesting because in the report, they mentioned this uh, tycoon 2FA. And it sounds like they've really made it easy, exactly like you've said. It's like a business. It's got good landing pages that uh, give you fake Microsoft 365 logins, Google logins. Um, it picks up your tokens because that's another problem. So let's mention that because one of the problems is when you log into a website, and this has been a problem I've seen on YouTube and a lot of places, it stores the cookie on your computer, right? So your session token can be stolen. And it looks like they're really good at doing this. Yeah, or, or you can do um, a bit like phishing. You can have the fake page, but at the same time, when someone goes and, and logs in, you send the legitimate ping to them. So they think that they're, that they're logging in. Yeah, there's lots of ways of doing it. Um, unfortunately, yeah, human ingenuity um, has no bounds, certainly when it comes to illicit gain. Um, so again, yeah, be, be aware of it. This is why we say 2FA, it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to completely, completely um, solve the problem, but it goes a hell of a long way. And also in those logs, so your hunting ground, you've got the trace but you've got to be looking for it. So Martin, the problem is, you know, those cookies are stored in your computer and a lot of like social media companies will let you stay logged in for a long time. Do we force users to log out? Uh, it's always a possibility. Um, however, let's be realistic. Um, are you really going to log out every time you check social media and then log back in again with your 20 character password and the 2FA when you just want to check, you know, what pub, what pub your mate is in or whatever. It, it's not. So Martin, you've mentioned this word quite a few times, paranoia or being paranoid. But on the flip side, you've also said that you can't, you know, have it weighing you down too much. Do I need to go live in a cave? Quite the opposite. Uh, you need to be a healthy, rounded individual. We, we are all in this, in the cybersecurity industry, we're in this because we want to make the world a better place. Yeah. Everyone who works in cybersecurity is working towards making the world more secure and fighting against the bad guys. The flip side of that is, you know, you can feel the pressure. Yeah. Um, you know, the threats don't stop. It keeps coming. Yep. Um, you know, it is 24-7, 365 days, um, days a year. It is so, so important that everyone in the industry looks after themselves. Um, you cannot be effective in your fight against threats if you are burnt out. So for everyone's good, not just your own, but also those systems that you're protecting. And I know there's people out there who are the only person in their entire company who are keeping the lights on and protecting their systems against attacks. If you are that person... You need, it is so, so important that you take the time to de-stress because after a while it will get to you. So both um, physical and mental health is so, so important. And I, I 
fundamentally believe that the two are very, very closely linked. Yeah, you've been doing this for 21 years, man. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, I'm still breathing. There, there have been some close calls, but I am still breathing. Um, so getting up away from the computer. Spend some time a day away from the computer. I know everyone who's watching this, their hobby is going to be computers. Their job is going to be computers. They spend their life in front of a keyboard. I do the same, but I make sure that at least uh, actually six times a week for an hour a day, I am doing exercise. Um, so number one, physical health. Every hour or even better, every 50 minutes, get up out of the chair, go walk around, get the blood moving. If you've got some kind of weights uh, next to you, even like a water bottle, wave, wave, wave it around, get the blood pumping, yeah. stand up, get away from the computer at least once an hour. If you can do exercise an hour a day, Double benefit. It doesn't have to be super hard exercise. It can be just be walking outside. Even better if it gets your blood flowing and your heart pumping and yourself a little bit out, out of breath. One, that's looking after your physical health. Also, it helps your mental health so much. You have to de-stress. You have to take some time away from all of that pressure to keep the lights on, to fight to hide the bad guys. You have to do something else so that you're allowing your mind to relax and you're allowing your mind to um, to de-stress. Uh, my thing that I, I found fairly late in life is actually running very, very slowly, but long distances through the through the countryside. And the 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 biggest thing that it get that it that it gave me, and one of the reasons why I started, is I realised that if I'm out running in the middle of the countryside, and someone phones me because there's a problem, yeah, you can do there nothing. is yeah. nothing that I can do. Exactly. You know, if I'm four hours away from the laptop, there is absolutely nothing I can do, and they will have to phone someone else. So even if you are not technically on call, if you're working, so you're always on call. You know, there's always going to be people calling you, um, whether it's about work or a personal issue or, or whatever. Make sure that you can be away from that and completely disconnected so that the, the, the problems aren't continuously your problem. Um, at least one day a week, be completely disconnected. Go do something else. Recharge and get rid of all that stress. And what you will find is when you're thinking about something else, this is when you have your best ideas. When you've got your mind distracted and you're thinking about something else, you're allowing your mind to wander. It's at that moment that you will come up with, hey, I know how to solve that problem. I know how to find this threat. And you can then go in and be more performant at your job because if you're thinking about this 24-7, focused on just one just one thing, that, that inspiration, that creativity will never come to you. You need to uh, um, help that creativity come. And you do that by thinking about something completely different, decharging, getting rid of the stress, doing something else, and also looking after your, your, your physical health. Yeah, I mean, there's a big problem with the mental, mental health. A lot of people are struggling. Yeah, yeah, because they get burnt out because the threats never stop. Um, we're, we're, we're understaffed. We're always understaffed. We never quite have enough people. Uh, the bad guys are continuously hitting us. Um, our jobs are important to, to, to us, keeping these systems uh, alive and the, and, the, uh, and the lights on. We never get the recognition that we, that we, that we deserve. Um, but it's so, so, so important, especially once you begin to feel those, those signs of, of, of burnout and the stress getting too much. Yeah, disconnect, disconnect, go do something else, go do something physical, something that doesn't involve computers, because, yeah, you're important. Martin, I really want to thank you for sharing, but also, you know, not just the technical stuff, but also like the life stuff, because we're humans and we yeah. we, we need help. Um, you, once again, are the author of this book, you work for Cisco Telos, but a big question a lot of people will be having is, you know, can they connect to you on LinkedIn or somewhere, how can they get hold of you? So uh, number one thing, read the Talos blog, because this is where we're, we're posting everything that yep. we think um, is important. Um, yeah, I'm I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, genuinely, I am open to people connecting. Appreciate that. Uh, the first thing I would say, yeah, don't look like a scammer. <laughs> um, you know, don't be weird. Uh, but seriously, if there's, you know, I, I'm in this business to help people. Uh, and if there's a way that I can help, please, please, please get in touch. Uh, um, specifically when it comes to people early in career and helping them with careers and career advice. Um, again, get in touch and, um, you know, I can give some advice or at least some pointers. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm here to help. Get in touch. 
Um, don't be weird. Don't look like a scammer. <laughs> I like it. I've put Martin's links below. Go and connect. But again, don't look like a, a scammer. Martin, thanks so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers.